I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Great to be back here for day two of ASX week, uh, one of our favorite weeks of the year where we partner with the ASX uh, to celebrate ASX Investor Day and get the opportunity to speak to some of the best speakers from that day. That's it. The ASX Investor Day is a day designed to provide investors of all levels with practical tools and knowledge to help improve their investment strategy and build their investing confidence. So those in the Equity Mates community will know that we've partnered with the ASX uh, Investor Day for the past couple of uh, iterations. And now we're coming at you again with five more experts across the week. But Ren, uh, what can we expect? Yeah, jam-packed week. So yesterday, we kicked it off with Lauren Jackson from Fidelity talking about key mega trends driving global markets. Today, we're joined by Rachel White from Vanguard uh, speaking about the changing face of investing. And still to come this week, we've got Dania Zinarova from Wilson Asset Management and Anthony Doyle from Firetrail, both speaking about some of their top investment insights from around the world. And then we close the week out with Adam Dawes from Shaw and Partners with a buy, hold and sell episode. So plenty of content to cover this week, but Bryce, there's even more at ASX Investor Day. If people want to actually attend the day, what are the details? Well, the exciting news is it kicks off this week, Brisbane 14th of May at the Sofitel, then uh, heading down to Melbourne on the 21st of May at the Grand Hyatt, and then closing out in Sydney on the 28th of May. Ren and I will be at the Sydney event, so Equity Mates community, if you're here in Sydney, come along and have a chat, but plenty of awesome guests uh, speaking at these events on the day. So head to the ASX website, and uh, without further ado, it is our absolute pleasure to welcome Rachel White to the Equity Mates studio. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Bryce, Ren. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here with you both and your listeners. So uh, Rachel is Head of Financial Advisor Services for Vanguard Australia. In this role, Rachel is responsible for the growth of Vanguard's business with financial advisors. She previously was Head of Product Strategy in, in Australia and held a similar role in the UK uh, both at Vanguard. So plenty to cover today. As Ren said at the top, uh, we're going to be discussing the changing face of investing. So Ren, let's crack in. Yeah, well, Rachel, uh, your presentation at ASX Investor Day starts with a really encouraging statistic, and that's where we wanted to start the interview today. Uh, women made up 45% of new investors in the previous 12 months. And if we look back five or 10 years ago, that number was 31%. So a really encouraging uh, move in the last five or ten years. Uh, what do we? What should we be attributing this improvement to? Yeah, it's really encouraging, isn't it? So what we what we're seeing is investors are getting younger, and they're more likely to be female. And there's actually been quite a surge in uh, female investors under the age of thirty four. And why is that? Look, there's a couple of reasons. I think the first, and this isn't a new uh, story, but historically low interest rates. So people's savings aren't earning much at all in a bank account or a term deposit. It does finally look like rates are going to start rising again, but it's going to be a very gradual lift off virtually nothing. You know, you've got a 12-month term deposit rate that's still only providing about 0.25%. <laughs> so that's not all that appealing for yeah. most people, uh, particularly when you've got core inflation at between 2 and 3% and it's on the rise. Mm. So people are looking for an alternative. You then, you've got a bunch of younger investors who are looking to investment markets as an alternative to property because it's either completely out of reach given sky high residential property prices or other, you know, people are saying, you know, do I really want to have all my money tied up into one asset that's got pretty low liquidity, huge costs to service and sell, paying off a giant mortgage for the rest of my life? Would I prefer to put my savings in a well-diversified investment portfolio where I know my costs, I control my costs, I can sell, top up as I see fit? Is that actually a much smarter approach? And when we think about women, 
you know, I think pleasingly what we're seeing is investing is just becoming way more democratised and the stereotypes of who an investor is, who an investor can be, it's changing and you've now got some incredible information for people who are just getting started or who are learning as they go, you know, online tools, events, great podcasts <laughs> like you guys. Um, I also love your other Equity Mates media podcasts that talk money to me. Um, you know, my female friends in particular, they love that show and it's great to see there's more female-focused content out there that's specifically targeting women and it brings them to the table. The only final point I'll just make on that, on um, this question is the other pleasing thing is barriers to entry are coming down when it comes to investing. So there's been this myth that, you know, you can't get started with investing until you've got serious money saved and that's probably because you know, 10 years ago, that was somewhat true. You know, if you wanted to invest in managed funds, sometimes you needed fifty, dollars $100,000 to get started. And so people sat off on the sidelines until their 40s and 50s. And for women who on average do have less disposable income, that's a really high hurdle and it's a very daunting amount. But now you can get started investing in ETFs from $200. So that's a game changer for most people. Mm. Yeah, it's been great to see over the last few years the um, you know minimums drop and technology improves so that it is becoming more accessible for us retail investors to get access to the market. Um, so you mentioned there that's one barrier, and with about fifty percent of the population being female, forty five percent is not a true reflection of, I guess, the Australian population. So what other barriers still exist uh, at the moment? Yeah, it's not reflective and that's new investors. So yeah. when you actually look across the board, the number's even lower again. Mm. And I'll tell you a story. So my first job at university, part-time role, was at a stockbroking firm. And in my final interview, uh, they told me, look, you're the first woman that we've ever hired in the firm. And it became pretty clear to me early on that the culture really wasn't all that inclusive. For women and it was you know to the point that actually from a career perspective when I finished uni I stepped away from investments for a while and it actually took me a couple of years before I stepped back in and look since then I've had the most incredible career I've worked for very supportive inclusive companies and been inspired by some amazing male and female leaders but it's amazing almost every female you speak to has kind of one or two of those stories mm-hmm. So, you know, there has been stereotypes, there has been, you know, non-inclusive behaviour, but that's becoming way less acceptable. And as more women get involved, the more balanced it becomes, those stereotypes are just fading away. The other point I just made on, on barriers, I think, sometimes I worry that the market gets the narrative wrong. You know, sometimes there's a lot of talk about the fact that women aren't confident or we're really risk averse. But what I think is really important is that the industry is actually reinforcing that women are really competent investors. Mm. Like, of course, everyone, when you first get started, you're pretty fearful, you know, am I going to lose it all? I don't know what I'm doing. And that risk is more confronting when you have less saved. So, you know, there is a gender pay gap still and women are earning about $26,000 per annum less than, than men on average. So if we can kind of collectively tell this narrative that women are really smart investors, doesn't take a finance degree to be a good investor, it's about doing a few things well. And when I say a few things, I mean make and stick to an investment plan. Mm. Like ask yourself why you're investing, what for, diversify your portfolio, invest for the long term and be disciplined in your approach. And if we can reinforce these simple but really steadfast principles uh, I think that really helps take the fear factor out. Mm. Mm. Now, obviously, when we say something like women are better investors than men, we're speaking in generalities and, you know, there's obviously uh, there's nuances to all this data, but the data on the whole does suggest that women are better investors than men. And uh, some Vanguard uh, data suggests that women are slightly more diversified and less likely to engage in frequent trading behaviour. Um, can you talk to that data and maybe any of uh, any other data that you have that suggests differences between the average female investor and the average male investor? Yeah, so definitely this is averages. And I don't think it's better, maybe it's different, but there are two big differences that we see between men and female investors. So 
The first one is attitude to risk. So Vanguard conducted a study in our US business across 4 million accounts. And the results showed that women weren't risk averse. They were just quite risk conscious. So as you mentioned, men and women actually had really similar exposure to equities or a risk asset, but women skewed their portfolio towards less concentrated risk. So they're less likely to hold individual stocks and more likely to hold balanced, diversified investments like ETFs. And when we looked at Australia's personal investor platform, it showed really, really similar findings. So women held about 60% of their investments in pooled funds like ETFs, whereas for males it was more like 50%. Second big difference is um, how males and females approach trading. So women on average are less likely to engage in frequent trading, about 50% less in fact. And that's important because frequent trading can be pretty harmful to investment returns. Mm. So there was quite a, a famous study that was done. It's pretty old now. You've probably heard of it. It was back in the late 90s. It was from some researchers at Berkeley University, and they looked at male and female investing behaviour across 35,000 accounts, and they showed really similar results. So males were trading about 45% more than women. But what was interesting was that this additional trading saw men on average underperform by about 1% per annum. And 1% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you compound that over mm. many years, it could be pretty serious money. Mm. So this overtrading eroded wealth because getting tactical calls right with investing is very difficult. Mm. And even the best investors will tell you that. You know, Most professional fund managers will tell you they can't do it. I'm sure you hear that from many of your guests on this show. Uh, and that's professionals who do it full time. So imagine how hard it is for the everyday punter. Mm. Um, and then you've got the tr cost factor to trading. So every time you trade a share or an ETF, there's a cost or typically a cost. So a lot of platforms might charge you five, 10, $15 brokerage every time that you buy and sell. So if you're making regular trades, these costs are just going to burn into your net returns. And particularly when you're trading smaller amounts, that could be a pretty decent percent of your investable assets. Mm. And it was interesting back in March 2020 during the COVID market volatility, uh, locally we saw a very similar pattern. So more men were changing their portfolio compared to women through that period. And as we know, the market dropped about 30% in 20 trading days mm but then it recovered really dramatically in a very short period. So if you were trading through that period, you could have missed a lot of upside. Yeah. Um, so if we get back to, to the study, the concluding point of the, the study was that this pattern of more regular trading was due to an overconfidence factor. So some <laughs> males exhibited a tendency to be more confident about making the right decision, so they traded more frequently. But what I do think is a the, the key learning here is actually for many females and it's, hey, if you're a bit hesitant, if you're lacking in a bit of confidence, you know what, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It might actually serve you quite well once you get started and, and help you to have that discipline in your investment approach to stay the course. Mm -hmm. So, Rachel, Vanguard is an American business. You've worked in both the UK and Australian offices, and we've just kind of set the scene about what's happening here in Australia. But how does the female investing participation uh, in Australia compare to female investing participation over in the US and the UK? So, pleasingly, it's going up across the board. So, just like in Australia, um, you've got about 28% of women in the UK investing in the share market similar in the US, but it's going up. So there's been a 30% increase in women making household financial decisions in the US from just five years ago. And really interestingly, it, the gender pay gap in the UK has actually closed for women under the age of 40. Wow. And a big reason for that is because women are now much better represented in higher pay, paying industries. So like investing, for example, which has, you know, historically been much more dominated by males. Yeah. And when we see this new money that's going into the hands of women investors, it's really interesting for, you know, say the financial advisor community. In Australia, only a quarter of financial planners are women. 
not often women have a preference to see another woman because they understand some of their different behaviors or unique challenges that women face, like less super, taking more time out of work, working part-time more. Um, so advice practices that are thinking about this and being more forward-looking in how they can engage this new group of investors, you know, they're going to be rewarded. And I think the same can be said about the broader investment community. It's important to be asking, how do I capture this new audience versus just doing what I've always done and hoping that that, that resonates. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. There's That's a uh, really pleasing data out of the uk hopefully we see australia follow i guess if we broaden it out from just uh the changing uh male female split uh but more broadly uh between the us where vanguard's based the uk where you previously worked and now australia do you see many differences Mm. in investing culture or habits of retail investors between these three countries So one big difference we see here in Australia is the allocation to Aussie equities. So the Australian market represents about 2-3% of global markets and most investors here hold 50-60-70% of their portfolio in Aussie equities. Um, So that's really common and that means you've got a really material overweight to our home market. And our home market is pretty concentrated, given you've got a few large banks and resource companies consuming a a big part of the index. In contrast, if you're sitting in the US, the US market is 60% of global markets. So if you've got a 60% allocation to US equities and the rest in international markets, you've actually got a really balanced portfolio. The other related point here is Australians love Australian equities because of yield. So because we've got franking credit system, we've got high dividend payout ratios by many Australian companies, investors get a very attractive grossed up dividend yield, mm. uh, somewhere around 5 to 7%. In other regions, they don't have this dynamic. So you might be lucky to get a 2% dividend yield on a global or a, a US equity fund. So typically US and UK investors allocate more to bonds or fixed income particularly when they're trying to seek income. I would say, however, Australian investors' allocations to bonds are going up. They are using more fixed income in their portfolio, but they use it more as a defensive asset class. So investing in higher quality fixed income like government bonds or investment grade credit. Mm. Mm. So when you when you talk about those different preferences, and I, I don't think any Australian listener would be surprised that Uh, There's a lot of home country bias here and that we have a preference for uh, dividend paying stocks. Um, I think uh, a lot of Australian investors would riot if some of those big blue chip companies (laughs) um, uh, cut their dividend. Uh, Does that translate into uh, different investing practices? And by that, I mean, you know, are the uh, American investors in Vanguard products uh, overweight or preferencing different products to maybe an Australian investor? Yeah, so re- sort of extending upon the, the final question, we, we offer less fixed income products here in Australia than we do in, in, in many of our other regions, particularly those bond funds that are designed for yield. So, you know, emerging market debt, high yield fixed income ETFs, they're much less popular here. Interestingly, across all three regions, we see a high level of consistency in investors just loving low-cost, broad-based, home market, global equity funds. Mm. Um, They like them, they use them at their core, uh, and they're our most popular ETFs no no matter where you go. Globally, we've we've also been very successful with our diversified product range. So that's our multi-asset funds. So they're essentially all in one investment solutions. They'll set your asset allocation, they do automatic rebalancing, they give you local, global, emerging market equities and defensive assets. And investors really love those products because they take the guesswork and time out of investing. You buy one ETF and your portfolio is set and you get to outsource those hard decisions to us. Interestingly, in Europe and the UK, we actually don't offer these products as ETFs yet because the ETF market over there is very institutional. Yeah, right. So the managed fund version is quite popular, but ETF demand's not there. Whereas in Australia, that's actually one of our fastest growing ranges because 
the ETF market in Australia is largely comprised of individual investors or advisors who are investing on their behalf. Mm. One other really interesting one that we see differences in demand and also, I suppose, product availability is sustainable investing or ESG. Mm. So ESG investing in Europe is definitely in the main stage. Last year, I think it was about 60, 65% of all cash flow into ETFs went into ESG ETFs. So that's, a, that's an enormous figure. And in the US, it's actually something like 1% or 2%. Oh, and then wow. Australia kind of sits somewhere in the middle. So pretty stark differences. And in Europe, I think we've seen such a significant increase because, you know, you've got very supportive regulatory measures, government policy, and you're just not seeing that in the US. In the US, you've also got a much more divided public opinion. Mm. But in Australia, we're seeing really positive momentum, um, largely from everyday investors just saying, hey, I expect this or I want this. And so product issuers are responding. They're building out their range of ESG products. And I think interestingly, there's, a, I suppose, a bit of a view in the market that everyone wants their own slice of ESG and, you know, there's these really material differences between region or individuals that make ESG really hard for a pooled investment vehicle like an ETF or a managed fund. But we actually conducted a global study into ESG preferences a couple of years ago and it was amazing. There was a really high level of consistency in terms of what people wanted to avoid investing in. Um, So when you exclude certain sectors or companies, fossil fuels, gambling, controversies, nuclear weapons, really, really similar um, preferences. So we bought out a range of ESG ETFs that are pretty much exactly the same across all three regions. But we we do continue to do a fair bit more work on ESG both locally and globally. We do think it's an enduring trend in all three regions. We think it matters to a growing cohort of investors. We spoke about female and younger investors. They're shown to be particularly socially conscious. Um, But the thing with ESG is there is a lot of grey, particularly if you're trying to build a portfolio of the best ESG companies or securities, like defining what the best is, it's very hard. It's very subjective and it likely requires forward-looking inputs. So for us, we're being very, very thoughtful in determining what the right product format is for that type of exposure. And, you know, maybe an index ETF actually isn't the right way to go there. And in the US and the UK, we've we've recently brought out active ESG strategies. And it's actually something we're doing some time thinking about locally. Well, Rachel, it is good to hear that, uh, broadly speaking, we're all quite similar around the world because that aligns with our ethos here at Equity Mates that investing truly is global. Doesn't matter which country you're in, you should you should be having access, and and the, the, the principles remain the same wherever you are. So glad that's the case, and certainly we're seeing here through the Equity Mates community um, the rise in interest of ESG. So that's really good to hear as well. Some surprising stats coming out of the states. Though. Yeah, can the states lift their game? <laughs> yeah. What's going on really there? Really surprising. <laughs> so Rachel, one of the the biggest questions that we often get in the ex- Equity Mates community is uh, a list of five ETFs and everyone wanting to compare them and understand which one they should be investing in because there's so many listed ETFs at the moment, over 250, I think, on the ASX and who knows how many listed overseas. If we were to extrapolate this trend, it feels like we'll eventually have more ETFs than listed companies, (laughs) which is going to create chaos. (laughs) What do you think the future of Australia's ETF industry is? Yeah, I actually looked up and so at the end of 2021 there was over 8,500 ETFs offered globally. Gee, there you go. Wow. <laughs> that is a lot of ETFs. Yes, that and is. <laughs> I worry about just how many ETFs there are because, as you said, like, it's so hard to know well, which ones are the good ones. Mm. And the more there are, the harder it is to answer that question. And as an investor, you have to be a lot more discerning. So I suppose I do hope that the number of ETFs offered in the market slows down. I do think that would be a good thing. And I've worked in product development for for many years at Vanguard and it takes us a really long time to launch an ETF. We actually go through a very serious due diligence phase and we look at things like 
you know, investment characteristics and merit? Does the asset class of the ETF improve long-term investment outcomes? Does it diversify away stock-specific risk? Is it going to meet the needs of our investors over different market cycles? And will it be used appropriately? Does it have the right level of liquidity? You know, an interesting dynamic with ETFs, you can't shut an ETF like you can with a mutual fund. So you've got to take a really, like, close it from from new investors coming in, I mean. So you have to take a really long time horizon when you're thinking about suitability and feasibility. And I think that on the plus side, from a Vanguard perspective, you know, our clients really know, our investors really know what type of investors or what type of products they're going to be getting from, from Vanguard. But when I do think about the number of ETFs offered in Australia, I'm pretty optimistic that we won't get the same level of product proliferation as we're seeing in certain other markets. And I think that comes back to a point I mentioned earlier. I just don't think we're going to see institutional investors swarm the market in Australia. And the reason for that, I mean, super funds don't, don't really have an incentive to buy ETFs, maybe around the edges for kind of tactical short-term trading strategies. But the rest of the insto market here is really small. So I do think that will probably help moderate the number of ETFs that are offered in the Australian market. Mm. So Rachel, um, you mentioned there that you spent a lot of time in product development, uh, figuring out the suitability and feasibility of ETFs for a market uh, in the UK and more recently in Australia. If you flip it around and if you put yourself in the shoes of a retail investor who's trying to figure out the suitability and feasibility of ETFs for their portfolio, uh, you know, Bryce gave the scenario where someone's looking at five, maybe ASX 200 ETFs, maybe S&P 500 ETFs. Um, how, how would you suggest, what are some of the factors you would suggest they consider when uh, looking at those five, however many uh, exchange traded products that all appear to be quite similar? Look, I think you've got to figure out what you're trying to achieve with that exposure. Don't just buy an ETF to buy an ETF. There's more and more ETFs available. And back in the day, it was really easy to talk about the benefits of ETFs. Yeah, they give you market exposure, they're diversified, they're low cost, transparent, tax effective, and they're built for the long term. There's a huge asterisk next to that same statement now because there's lots of ETFs that that don't have all of those benefits and there's actually some ETFs now that, that won't give you any of those things. Mm. So you do have to be more savvy and if you're buying an ETF because you want you know that transparency, you want to see what they're holding, uh, the under, underlying ETF is buying, if it's because you believe in low cost investing, then you've got to make sure that you're looking at those aspects and finding the ETF that is going to help you achieve that. Mm. So Vanguard pioneered the ETF industry with the passive index investing approach. Uh, we'd love to get your thoughts though, Rachel, on what you what you're seeing with the variety of new active ETFs that are coming into the space and the niche thematic ETFs, you know, these ETFs that are exciting and hitting on some big key mega trends, um, certainly getting a lot of buzz in the equity mates community. But given your passive index investing approach, what, what do you think of the uh, this, this new trend? Yeah, I think I get an email every week about a new ETF that's launched, a video games ETF. It's all very exciting. I think last year, about 30% of all new ETFs that launched were thematic. But interestingly, they only represent about 2% of assets. So they get quite a lot of airtime because they do have, you know, a catchy headline. But a lot of investors are still being pretty cautious with, with more niche in investments. And I think when you've got a market environment where rates are going to go up and you've got more volatility in markets, that does mean there's additional risk with, with certain thematic ETFs, particularly those that have been propped up by years of low to no interest rates, investing in companies with little to no earnings, trading on high multiples. Uh, those ETFs are probably going to go through a difficult time. So investors are, I think, being quite conscious of that. But at Vanguard, we, we talk about a concept, you've, I'm sure you've heard of it, called core satellite. Mm -hmm. And it's an approach to building a portfolio where you have broad-based, low-cost index funds at your core, and then you use more active or niche 
funds as satellite exposures around the edges. And it's a really nice technique because your core protects your portfolio. But if your risk tolerance allows it, you can speculate with your satellite exposures and they have that potential for big returns. But given their sort of smaller peripheral exposures, it's not going to blow up your portfolio if the ETF comes crashing down. So I think that's where these types of ETFs are, are more interesting. But with Active, it's probably the best kept secret in the market, but Vanguard does offer Active funds. Um, we, we actually just do it in a low-cost way. So we've offered Fundamental Active since 1975 when we first opened our doors and more recently, you know, sort of active factor-based ETFs. And interestingly, in Australia, one of our most popular ETFs this year has been our value factor ETF, and that's actively managed by our quant team in the US. And given so many investors have been overweight growth and values back in favour, you know, this is a great ETF to give you systematic exposure to value stocks. So for Vanguard, it's not about index versus active. It's actually about high cost versus low cost. Mm. And so when you are thinking about investing in active, just make sure you're thinking about your cost. Costs are one of the things you can control with investing. So our value factor ETF charges 0.28%. You know, your other ETFs in the market that are charging over 1%. And the higher your cost, the higher the bar is for that manager to outperform. And all the studies will tell you there aren't too many managers in the world that have been able to outperform consistently over time. In Australia, only about 20% of, of active funds have outperformed over a 10-year period. Um, so to increase your odds of outperforming, you've got to be really fixated on what cost you're paying. Mm. Well, Rachel, we have almost finished the interview. Uh, before we finish with our final three questions, firstly, just want to thank you for your time today, but remind the Equity Mates community that you can see Rachel at the ASX Investor Day, along with many other experts from around Australia. Uh, Brisbane this weekend, 14th of May, Melbourne on the 21st of May, and then Sydney on the 28th of May. You can head to the ASX website. Uh, we'll put the link in our show notes. There is a, a link at the top of their homepage where you can register. Uh, and grab your ticket uh, and we will be at the Sydney one on the 28th of May so if you want to come and have a chat um, as well we'll be there so uh, Ren final three yeah let's do it so uh, Rachel the first of the final three questions do you have any books that you consider must read well, I couldn't work at Vanguard and not quote a Jack Bogle book <laughs> <laughs> And so for any of your listeners who haven't heard of him, Jack was the founder of the Vanguard Group and essentially he was the pioneer and inventor of index investing, the first index fund. He had a mission in life, democratise investing for the everyday investor, no nonsense, low fee, fair investing for everyone. And he was a bit of a celebrity in the investing world back in the US. He's even got a group of diehard followers called the Boggleheads. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But, look, Jack passed away in, in 2019 and, and Warren Buffett paid tribute to him saying that Jack did more for the everyday investor than any individual he's, he's ever known. So that was quite the acclamation. But Jack, Jack wrote a number of books. Uh, my favourite one is called The Little Book of Common Sense Investing and it's just a classic guide to smart investing. And it's quite amazing that his principles, which, you know, Vanguard still follows to this day, they endure. And even after, you know, 15, 50 years, they continue to serve investors really well. Mm, yeah, nice. love that. That's a great recommendation. And uh, if people haven't heard of Jack Bogle, they should definitely look him up. You might have got some more Bogle heads out of this interview. <laughs> uh, so, Rachel, uh, we know Vanguard doesn't like to pick individual stocks, but we always like to ask our experts for the best company they've ever seen before. Uh, and we don't mean, you know, best investment today. We don't worry about valuation, just purely on company fundamentals. Uh, what's one of the best companies you've ever come across? So I'm going to cheat a little bit, Ren and Bryce, because I think it would be remiss of me to talk about ETFs for I half know. an hour and then lob over a hot stock tip. So I'm breaking the rules a bit, but I'm going to give you my favourite Vanguard ETF. Nice. Um, and it's the, the high growth diversified ETF. So VDHG, 35% Aussie shares, 50% international shares, 5% emerging market equities, 
10% defensive assets. It's just a really rock solid ETF. It's had 11% performance per annum every year for the last 10 years or on average over 10 years. It's low cost. It provides you with a set asset allocation, automatic rebalancing. It's just perfect for your core uh, and one you can sleep easy with. Nice. Nice one. I, I would have thought with over $7 trillion under management, <laughs> Vanguard as a company comes uh, <laughs> comes under consideration here, but uh, I, I appreciate the ETF um, all the same. Uh, Rachel, the final question that we like to end the interview with, if you think back to your early days as an investor, starting out in financial services, uh, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, Vanguard is actually a mutual fund. So uh, we're actually owned by the investors in our funds, hence our, you know, client centricity and uh, approach to investing. (laughs) So we can't invest in Vanguard, but um, otherwise, yes. Um, But look, advice, I'm sure there's quite a lot. I'd have to say, look, start earlier and start with less. Like I was one of those people who waited on the sidelines until I, you know, built up a reasonable nest egg to invest. And if I went back, I'd just start with $200 and I'd continue to invest regularly. And, you know, when you look at the how impactful compounding is and time in the market, I was reading the other day, if you invest about $50 a week in a low-cost Australian equity index fund from the age of 25 to 65, when you retire at 65, you'd have a million dollars. Like that, that's pretty huge um, from $50 a week and it just reinforces how successful you can be as an investor by making investing a regular habit and just maximizing that time in market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a, a great way to finish uh, some advice that we often receive on the show. So it obviously is uh, one that everyone should be listening to. So Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting through the changing dynamic of the investing landscape here in Australia and overseas. And um, a reminder to our community, if you would like to see more of Rachel, uh, head to the ASX Investor Day. So Rachel, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks, Rachel. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.